When men and women are in prison, doing time, long time or short time, there'll be minor situations that affect many people in the prison. And so that, that's one wound that starts festering, that create the seed that creates a riot. When you look back at the causes of Attica, you can't help but realize that it could happen again at any moment. When you ignore an entire group, like prisoners, and like everybody else, when they feel as if there's no option, or it doesn't matter anymore, you always have the potential for violence. Attica happened in a unique time, 1971, when the whole idea of civil rights was first beginning to develop. But I'd be naive to say that a prison riot couldn't happen again. We predicted that Attica would happen on the heels of a mini riot at Auburn State Prison, which is the oldest of the state prisons. And our fears were fueled by our recognition that at that time, the 12 and a half thousand uh, inmates in the system were all in overcrowded conditions. Just days before the riot, you know, a group of individuals um, with the union met with the superintendent and was very concerned about I think the heightened activity within the prison um, concerning the inmates. And they were very concerned for the safety of themselves. Um, and they were very concerned that something was going to happen within the jail. There was probably nobody on this side of the universe that did not hear about the riots and the uprising. I certainly think that how we treat our prisoners is an element of a description of our society. So the question is, if you take away their humanity inside, if you cage them, if you put them in unclean and un impure, if you will, environments, and then expect that there's going to be this miraculous change in their behavior when they come out, is ludicrous. A riot is a, is a, a, a blowout of the emotional um, tenure of the jail. The prisoners seemed to be, to a great extent, out of control. Um, I was called in by the prisoners uh, to come in and try to mediate and uh, attempt to participate in finding a solution to the rioting 11, 1,200 prisoners there in D Yard. I was taken hostage. The inmates set up a perimeter around us to protect us, Muslim inmates. And at one point, I can recall the, the uh, Muslim leader uh, instructing the inmates that no one was to pass through their guard. And if necessary, they were to sacrifice their life to save ours. You could, you could see uh, fires burning and smoke rising and windows windows being broken, and it was obvious that there were pressures building in uh, Attica at the time, uh, pretty much reflective, I thought, of what was going on in society. That was a time of civil and pol political unrest and protest. During the course of the negotiations, uh, Commissioner Oswald agreed to 28 of 31 demands. Uh, the 28 uh, demands dealt principally with conditions in the prison. Um, food, access to legal services, uh, right to worship, uh, right to communicate with the outside. Uh, those were more than housekeeping measures. Their demands were not for legal counsel to challenge their underlying convictions. That was off the table. They had issues with religious freedoms, with the uh, censorship of mail, one shower a week, regardless of what your job was, you got one shower a week. Toilet paper, there was one roll a month. 
Basically, what we were faced with during the course of these negotiations, there was agreement as to certain factors, but there was unwillingness to, uh, on the part of the administration to say, okay, we agree these 28, now let's get back in our cells. Well, they, the inmates were not ready for that. They felt they had a certain amount of power and control over their lives, and they were not about to give it up. It was during the riot that my father was injured. My father was brought out to the administration building uh, by four inmates who carried him on a mattress from Maybloch. Um, there is some three hours um, that time that has passed from when my father was injured in Times Square till the time he got to a hospital for medical care. The announcement came that William Quinn had died. And with that announcement, the, the whole negotiation process changed. And when I went outside the walls, that terrible rainy Saturday morning, uh, there, there was terrible hostility toward me and anybody else who was trying to negotiate the solution. By Sunday night, I can recall they allowed a Catholic priest to come in to administer last rites. Sunday night, and I was able to write a uh, goodbye note to my family. The hostages were blindfolded, and the threat was, if you use any force to retake, uh, we're going to slit their throats. We had told them what was going on on the outside in terms of uh, buildup of military-like uh, efforts, uh, sharpshooters, uh, which had us very concerned. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of troopers out there who wanted to get in there and get this thing over with. We're on the roof of A block, waiting for the assault to begin. This is a team of 270 rifle shooters. Time is 9.45 a.m. The hostages are on the catwalks with knives at their throats. I had an inmate executioner to my right with a hand-fashioned spear. I could look down either side of my nose past my blindfold to see what was going on. And I could recall seeing this hand-fashioned spear at my chest. And that executioner was a very angry individual. Anyway, he kept prodding me in the chest with the spear saying that he couldn't wait to see my gut spill in the yard. And I had another inmate executioner behind me with a ball peen hammer. And the third executioner was on my left with a knife at my throat. And I can recall sitting there when the helicopter came overhead was making the announcement for the hostages to be released unharmed. Then there was a pop and they opened fire. I reached up to push up my blindfold so that I could see what was going on. In the film, you can see the inmate with the spear. Pull up the spear and he starts down toward my chest with it. And just before he hit, hit me with the spear, they shot that inmate. And at that time, Noble was on my left and had a hold of my left shoulder. And he tried pulling me off the chair. So as I, he pulled and I leaned to the left, that opened up, that opened up for a clear shot at the, my executioner behind me with the ball peen hammer and they took out him. I jerked away from Noble, sat up straight in the chair 
tried to push up my blindfold, got my blindfold up, and at the same time, I got hit four times in the abdomen, and Noble got hit. And in slow motion, it's like dominoes. And there was a state trooper. He came out across the catwalk when they mounted the ground assault to retake the facility. So I said, don't, don't shoot, his name's Don Noble, and he saved my life. I laid on my left side in kind of a semi-fetal position. And uh, the fellow with the spear fell dead over my legs. frustrations of 40 years ago and the frustrations of today are really only separated by time. When the Attica uprising occurred, there were approximately 12,500 prisoners and 13 prisons. Today we have over 54,000 prisoners and 57 prisons. I think the, the question really is how do we prevent future problems what are we doing today to kind of guard against them? And are we paying attention to what's going on? In order for the facility, for the institution to operate, there has to be some balance between how the individuals are treated there and how the, the staff treats them. And so to have counsel that helps in either their external legal cases or their internal uh, management issues allows them to believe that there is law and order even inside a prison. One of the major demands of prisoners during Attica was the need for legal services, outside legal services, people that they could write to on the outside to air their grievances, somebody that would listen to them. The prison legal services arose as a reaction to the, uh, the, the revolt, say some, or the insurrection, say others, at Attica State Prison. At the time, there was a concern uh, that the prisons of New York were potentially going to be boiling over. And they wanted some people to be available to address the complaints that prisoners might have. And it was determined after that that uh, not only do prisoners have due process rights, they, in certain situations, can get counsel uh, from lawyers. And, and one of the biggest savings, the efficiencies that you might say by providing uh, uh, prisoners with attorneys is that it's an outlet. And if there's at least attorneys available un under certain situations, that could limit the amount of lawsuits that the uh, state of New York has to defend. Uh, as a practical matter, it's not only due process rights uh, that uh, are important uh, to, to uh, uh, take care of by providing prisoners and attorneys from time to time, uh, but it's also what it's helping to avoid. PLS is principally there to assist and protect the rights of inmates. But its overriding concern is protecting the safety of society. Prison is a microcosm of the larger society. And at the point where you lock up 2.3 million people, you have 7 million under supervision, and 65 million uh, Americans with a criminal record, that is something you cannot ignore. That is a quarter of the adult American population that's impacted by this system. So it's not about providing additional rights to some small segment of people who did something wrong. It has become a part of our culture. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. And so when an organization like PLS comes in and ensures that the wheels of justice operate the way we all intend it to operate, that's a win-win for everyone. So at the least, until we take this system and we shrink the entire beast, we should be ensuring that Americans that are caught up in the system, that people that are caught up in the system are treated fairly. I don't believe though this is a liberal conservative issue or a Republican Democrat issue. It's a human issue. It's what's best for the human beings who are implicated in a crime, the victim, the perpetrator, and then what's best for the society at large. We are concerned about uh, every individual uh, being treated humanely, uh, regardless 
of what their past record is. And if you're going to strict, strip people of their humanity while under total control by the government, what can you expect uh, when they are released? How can they adjust? We are the voice for prisoners. And that's why we have to be so vigilant about listening to what incarcerated New Yorkers have to say, what corrections officers have to say, because it is our job to make sure that we never have another Attica. I don't think I'll ever be done with Attica. I don't think Attica will ever be done with me. And it affects all of us.